all here for the final round of draft here at Pro Tour Phyrexia. Take it away, you two. Welcome to the booth here at Pro Tour Phyrexia. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Cheon. And uh, as they just outlined at the booth, <laughs> or at the desk, I should say, incredible deck here. Those in are some nice decks. Now, both of them are great, but I mean, it looked like a misprint somehow, right? It looked like when you saw two Glisses and the Mastercore in there for Shota, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and as you can see, even if the, the, the way that he kind of laid, built out his deck, it's to get to the late game. It is. He's got some cards that typically you don't see that, that people would play, but his main goal is like, look, I have all these rares in my deck. I just want to get to the late game. But that being said, that being said, uh, Benton's deck also looks phenomenal with the two copies of the Scrubs Hive. That is not an 0-3 deck. No, and Benton, much less interested in the late game. He will end up getting to that point, but I think this is going to be very problematic here for Shota because he's got these great individual threats, but if a Scrubs Hive hits the game like every, or hits the battlefield every game on turn two, it gets out of hand. Yeah, and you just can see, uh, it looks like Shota mulligan the sixth here. And he starts things off with Evolving Adaptive, which apparently there was just a ton of those opened uh, at the table. <laughs> like five, <laughs> yeah, six? Yeah, something like five or six of them. We know Nassif has one. Yeah, there's one here for Shota, and his opponent last round had like three. Yeah. Okay, Whew. hold your breath there, but it was not Skrelv's Hive. It was Branch Blight Stalker there for, uh, for Benton. And Shota not even attacking here, keeping two creatures back. Wants to put that Gladiator in front of the Stalker, knowing that Benton's primary strategy here is just to toxic you out. Oh, and he's well, got he's the got rare. His, he's got the Hive now. He's got the Hive. Probably going to run it out. The other option would be to potentially play a Planar Disruption on the Gladiator and then attack and force a Chump. For, excuse me, force the trade on the adaptive. Yeah, the Skrull's Hive, you know, you really do want to get it out there as soon as possible. The sooner you get it out, the bigger the army you can build and the quicker you can get your opponent corrupted because once that happened, once that happens, your uh, toxic creatures get lifelink. All right, so we're back to tabletop magic here. And for those of you familiar with some of the <laughs> older cards like Skrull's Hive, cards like Bitter Blossom, putting that die on top of your deck to give yourself that reminder so you don't forget the trigger on Skrull's Hive. And he's going to put it right back on top of his library there. You do what you got to do, Paul. Oh, I well, in the beginning, when I saw people do that, a lot of people would go, hey, why would you do that? Yeah. I'm just going to remember. Yeah. And then you forget that one time, and you go, okay, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to put that die on top. Yeah, sometimes it's funny because people will... They started putting a coin or a die on top, and then they just move it out of the way and draw the card, and it, it couldn't get through <laughs> their head. There was somebody um, at home at one of the local game stores, and he, have you ever seen one of those hamster balls? It's like two pieces of clear plastic, and you can put like a hamster, and they can run around the house. Okay. He, he took half of one of those, so it's like a clear dome, and put it over his library so that his hand could not even touch the cards, and he'd have to move it. I, I must like, make wow. action. I guess yes. the dice didn't get the job done. <laughs> All right, can, the board continues to be built out here for Shota. That Evolving Adaptive's now picked up four oil counters, so it's a 4-4 four -four somehow. The Lattice Blade Mantis putting that last one on. There's also an Armored Scrap Gorger for Shota. So he's built out a nice board, but I got to say, he can... He's going to run out at some point, and, you know, Benton won't, right? This Skrelv's Hive is going to continue to pump out these Phyrexian Mites turn after turn. Right. So now Shota's kind of in one of those positions where he probably does want to start attacking, mm -hmm. putting some pressure, because the longer the game goes, at some point, Benton can just go, you know what? Just take 10 poison, Yeah. right? Send them all in. Yeah, it gets, it gets interesting because the Skrelv's Hive has this really interesting play pattern to it where it, it dings you every turn and it puts out creatures that can't block. So it leaves you vulnerable to attacks in the early. But once you get your opponent corrupted, all of them get lifelink and then you can race very effectively. So Here right now, Shota has at least thus far not been able to take advantage of that early part, but now we see him slamming now. He's crunching for nine damage here. This is his first attack of the game, but it's a huge one. Yeah, no no great blocks here, right? You can't just do a clean one-for-one -one trade here, the Mantis being a 
would have to at least put two creatures in front of any of these cards. And I don't think that Benton particularly likes what he sees here. Two four toughness creatures coming over is very awkward for this board. Yeah, but taking nine here. Yeah, no way. Right? With with the Scrubs Hive in play and it showed up being pretty far away from being corrupted right now for the lifelink ability. What he really needs to take is his medicine here, because he's going to have to just throw two creatures in front of something. And of course, the fear being that uh, Shota has some way to disrupt this combat trick. Did he take it? Spell. Oh, he just took it? Okay. Okay, that's really risky, because remember that Skrull's Hive is ticking down. He's down to seven already just off of that one hit. And he has not gotten Shota corrupted or even close to it. He, in fact, he hasn't even got a poison counter on him yet. That's a gutsy take there for Benton. Now, he may be looking to use that planar disruption to crack back and get a whole bunch of toxic going in one big turn. Yeah, with that Plague Nurse in play as well, mm -hmm. right? You get the double trigger. Shota does have a Venomous Brutalizer in hand that would put an extra creature in play. Question as to whether or not he wants to actually proliferate. That would tap down the Scrap Gorger, right? Mm -hmm. Giving you one less one less blocker. Maybe he's more interested in having four blockers in play to lower the chances of actually getting any poison counters. Yeah, that Plague Nurse, I mean, that, that was really what Benton was thinking about because he doesn't want to lose any of his toxic creatures. So then do you want to chump with Predation Steward? And I was like, not really. Right. Because he could just steal this game. And is choosing to go ahead and um, proliferate here with the Brutalizer. Okay, don't forget, and he didn't. Back over to Benton. Benton predicted a loss this game, by the way. Cedric asked him in the interview, how do you think your next match is going to go? And he kind of laughed and said, I predict a loss. To be fair, when interviewed yesterday, Benton, did, going into the tournament, didn't expect to win any matches. And now he is here sitting at 9-1. and one. So he's been consistent. Right. I don't know if he knew who, who, who he was playing when he made that prediction either. <laughs> like, like Shota, I mean, he's got a reputation on the Pro Tour for being, it's interesting because he's actually a really nice guy, but one of the most intimidating players to play against. He plays very quickly, very decisively, and he gives you the impression that he knows what you're thinking and you're going to do better than you do. Right. He, he's, he's already adjusting his life pad Assuming and just kind of assumes you're going to do the thing that you're supposed to do, right. right? And it makes you get in your own head about like, well, what if I disappoint him and don't do the <laughs> right one that he thinks? Okay, he, ash he is going to use the predation steward here. He has not played a land yet, right? But I mean, doesn't have a, a great attack, right? I yeah, mean, you, you get great. it, you get in here, and Shota can. Does he just throw the Gladiator in front, or he could trade if he, he wants? He can throw the Gladiator in front, because keep in mind, Benton has to do some chump blocks next turn. He's yeah. down to six. Skrelv's Hive is going to put him down to five. Yeah. Right? So the, the Mantis and the Adaptive are both lethal attackers next turn. So he's going to have to use his Planar Disruption here. Probably on the Mantis, Mantis? I guess it's just the biggest creature. Because it, it, it's, a, it's a Vigilant creature. Right. The adaptive would have to turn it. I guess turn sideways. Right, it is slightly bigger as a five five versus five four. But he's cutting it real close here as Benton Manson. He's down to six. He's at a virtual five thanks to Skrelv's hive, and he was not able to get corrupted this turn, so he won't have it next turn either. Right. So now, I mean, if he, if he can survive this attack, and then put three poison counters on Shoda, he could leave some of his. Uh, toxic creatures back on defense that can block and it yeah. would have lifelink. Yes, that would be fine <clears throat> But right now he's at least got to put a creature in front of this adaptive It just gets so awkward right because at that point, you know If the lifelink if he were to get to that point Shota could be like, you know what go ahead <laughs> Like you're gonna die to your your, your hive potentially. I mean cause oh. he's cracking in for a bunch right now And look at this in Shota's hand off our immortality Woo. Benton might be considering a double block here with Plague Nurse and Dune Mover Onto this 5-5 five, five adaptive and if he does that Shota can kill both creatures and have that have that adaptive still live But Shota's in a fantastic spot either way because if they just, um, he can, uh, even if the double block doesn't happen or doesn't use a combat trick, he can still just play the Paladin in his hand. 
and just have another giant 4-4 creature in play. Wow, and it looks like Benton's going to go for the double chump lock here to keep his life total as high right. as possible. But this is going to start kind of securing the fate because we're going to see that Nimrazor Paladin here grab back a creature but put out another 4-4. And down to five falls, Madsen. What does he find with his draw step? I just, I just don't see how Where, he can where's the plan pu here? push things through. You can attack with everything. That does get you. No, it doesn't even get you. So if the stalker and the might gets blocked. Oh, you're right. It doesn't even get showed up to three poison. So it will not make him corrupt it. And then he won't have any blockers. So I just don't yeah. see a great way out of this. <laughs> and Shota's having none of it. He's no, just block your things. off two of them. So there's... A little too late here, the first yeah. poison counter for Madsen. Uh, and a charge of the might would kill a creature that's in play. So can kill the 5-5 five, five adaptive. But Benton's going to go down to four, and he's got to double chump both the Paladin and the Brutalizer. And, and he uh, is going to be at a virtual four on his... Yeah, this is... Uh, yeah. So this is a double chump lock? Guess so. Double chump lock, use a removal spell, have it all go well. Which, and by the a, way, it's not. There's right. an offer immortality here as well. Of course. Yeah, so the charge of the mites will fizzle due to the combat trick, and uh, Shota should take it down. One, two, three, four, five. And we're going to see offer immortality here from Shoti Asoka, and that will secure game number one. Interestingly there from Shota, the thing that really stood out about his list when we first saw it were the two copies of G Glissa Sunslayer. Didn't even see Didn't it. even need it. Nah. <laughs> I mean, his deck is incredible. Wow. I mean, the best card there was that uh, Evolving Adaptive. It was right. a 5-5 five, five for one mana. Yeah. And I mean, oh, that, boy. That, that is the reason why it's considered one of the best uncommons in the set, likely the best green uncommon in the set. And is that a mold of five here from Benton? It is. He's on five cards, and he, there's no good news coming. Oh, and the Skrull's Hive. Jeez, it. gets to rest That was the away. hope. That's, that was his chance on a mold of five. Does he have the other one? No. no. Blanche Bright Stalker is going to have to do a lot of work. You see the big fella in hand, too, Argentum Masticor. You don't usually beat that card. Yeah. And there's the Gladiator to jump in front. <clears throat> potentially of the uh, Stalker here. Yeah, and the uh, Cyborg card here, Shota recognizing that one of the ways that he can lose in this matchup is that turn two Skrull's Hive, bringing in that Duress out of the board. Oh, we got a four ball here. Okay. All right. Indoctrination Attendant is going to pick up a land here. That's going to create... Fantastic Mold of Five, yeah, to be this, fair. Yeah, this, is this isn't bad. And he's trying to decide if he wants to trade off this Stalker for the Fleshless Gladiator. And I think he probably should. Right, because now if you find a, a combat trick or a removal spell, your Might will be able to get through next turn. Decided not to, though. Okay. Ooh, is there no land drop here from, from Shota? Ooh, Every time I've seen him do that right. head shake and make that sound, <laughs> it's because something didn't go the way he needed it to. Yeah, I mean, his hand is... He's got a Masticor in hand, but no oh, land. Oh, it's going to be Copper Long Legs for him this turn, although that looks pretty good, actually. Okay. Benton yeah. needs to find a way to get a blocker out of the way. No great block on the Indoctrination Attendant, though. That's true, and it has Toxic 1 so that he can get that rolling. He still can offer a trade... With the Stalker if he'd like, though he's not going to. Going for the, the safe attack here. Oh, I wonder if he has the uh, the long-term game plan to go for safe attacks. We're going to find out. Looks like a Thirsting Roots, which not likely going to maybe add a Poison Counter. Might, might, might be seeing a Proliferate there. That's the type of card you can kind of keep sneaky in your hand. Yep. And, uh, you know, maybe Shota thinks he can go to nine poison, but can't. Ooh, there's land number okay. three off the top of the library, though. It doesn't help him that much. He's got Carnivorous Canopy in hand, but nothing else yeah. to do with it. So given that, and because he missed the land drop, might just go for the Offer Immortality, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing else to do, so just go block Offer Immortality and get that Attendant off the battlefield. And given what Benton has in hand, I mean, it's going to be basically just two mana kill your biggest creature. Yeah. Yeah, you know, even though Shota did miss a land drop there, and that can be deadly, especially against a, a relatively quick deck like what Benton has, it, it doesn't seem like that's how it's going to play out. And Benton's just out of gas here. Yep. So, and the creatures that he has in play are not really that threatening. 
And it looks like Shota missed another land drop here, Paul. He just right. said land, uh, draw go and pass the turn back. End step, breastline cultivator picks up a counter and uh, does Benton find okay. what he needs? Okay, he found That's a, a good one. nurse. No, oh, head shake. That's definitely not a land. Hey, that that Plague Nurse is the type of card that can get this thing really rolling here. But the real question is, does Benton just need to trade off this Blanche Bright Stalker? I feel like point? you want that Stalker just to get less power off the battlefield on Shota's side because mm. then the coast is clear for the Plague Nurse attack. Now, right exactly. now, it's still okay to attack with it, but you'd feel much better, right, if you can, if, if for example, this Gladiator just wasn't in play. And once again, Shota may be... Uh, again? He's going to go tie bar stand. So <laughs> these these are the best combat tricks ever. Defensive combat tricks are risky, but uh, he's actually pulled it off twice now because Benton doesn't have anything to punish him with. Yeah. Wow, so Plague Nurse hits the graveyard. That was big for Shota. Does he Okay, does he find a land. Okay. Okay. Green Sun's Twilight. And he Top finds... X it. plus one. There you go. And he's going to play his fours for the turn. But wait, there's more. Oh, okay. that's not and, bad and either. And now Rest all his mana there. issues are, are solved, right? Boy, finding a forest there was really yeah. nice. Benton is flooding. I like the way this is looking for Shota Yasuoka, especially if he can find himself a land here and slam Argenta Matsukor. I think it's just about done. Yeah, and this has got to feel bad. All of a sudden, Shota now turning things around and attacking with this gladiator. Not where you want to be. There's a Lattice Blade Mantis. No land number five yet for Shota, but he doesn't need it. Is this another land for Benton? Yeah, the way Benton wins this matchup is by coming off with a really, really aggressive start. As the game goes yeah. longer, we know Shota has the advantage in the late game. Yeah, you know, another thing that happened here was that turn one duress by Shota. If there was a Skrull's Hive on turn two, it would have gone unchecked this entire time, and there was a real game that plan for the was Nurse. Big. It was huge. Now Benton just has to go for the world record on Rustvine Cultivator oil counters, and uh, that's yeah. about all he can take. All right, well, he find vi found viral spawning, but somehow his green-white toxic deck has yet to even get Shota corrupted, yet let alone poisoned out. And now Shota's going to put a counter onto this and can just slam... That Argentum Masticor. It's so nasty against these tokens, too, Paul. Oh, yeah. You just discard a land and kill the Phyrexian Beast. It's like... Right. It, it already feels unfair, but that's, like, unfair, unfair. And now you don't even have to worry about a potential Skrull's Hive. Not that it would have done too much now on this battlefield, but yeah. you, you now have a, a, a creature that can destroy enchantments as well. And there it is. Argentum Masticor hits the battlefield. He, oh, you're not going to like that one, Benton. <laughs> He's giving it a quick... Is it as cut. bad for me as I think? Yes. Yes, it is. I think if I were Benton, I might just rip it in half and then offer the concession. Just, I'm yeah. not playing against that card. Look at that thing. <laughs> I mean, Shota doesn't need the card anymore after this round, so. True. Well, my first collection. That's fair. PT stamped Argentum Masticor. Go right in the old trade binder. Yeah, I'm not great at making magic yeah. in these positions. <laughs> Interesting Benton's talking out loud, and he's actually talking about what we talked about right. with the, the Branch Plates stalker, whether he should have traded off or at some point earlier. Yeah, I'm not sure it would have mattered. I think Shota was able to kind of climb out of this regardless. Yeah. If Benton had found perhaps a combat sp trick or a removal spell to punish Shota for one of his defensive combat tricks, then he might have had a chance, but... Now, I mean, I just, I, I don't think there's a collection of draws in Benton's deck that can get him out of this. He's going to discard Carnivorous Canopy to the Masticor. That's going to take down the Viral Spawning Token. And now both the Lattice Blade Mantis and their Argentum Masticor are going to get in the red zone. And yes, there was an oil counter left over on the Mantis, so it's 5-4. Yeah. This is really tough for Benton. I mean, six lands down there, not a lot of action the last few turns. Mulligan to five. Like, this is, just hasn't gone the way he wanted. <laughs> He's going to double block the Lattice Blade Mantis to get it off the battlefield. Six drop. Wow, really? Sky Trampler. Goal for two. Yep. Yeah, Shota's deck has a decent amount of reach creatures and spells that kill flyers, so recognizing right. that's how he can... There lose. you go. Land number seven is the battlefield for Benton Manted, and simultaneously he extends his hands in congratulations.
to Shoti Asoka for picking up this particular match. Now, again, both of these players came into this round with a 9-1 and one record, so not a disaster either way. You know, if you're 9-2, and two, you're still looking pretty good, but uh, that wasn't close. And Shota still just chugging along, right? Played in the World Championship, has been basically kind of at the top of his game for the last 15 to 20 years, and he just hasn't shown any signs of slowing down. He tests by himself, by the way. It's incredible. The fact that he's been able to have this consistent level of success back to tabletop, it's like, uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't, I didn't miss those three years. I'm just right back at it here. He's just right back in, and he is 10 and one here in Philadelphia. We're gonna take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more limited magic for you. Don't go anywhere. to coverage here at Pro Tour Phyrexia. Marshall Sutcliffe with Paul Chion, and we're here in the booth bringing you coverage of Limited. We're in the last round of Limited, actually for the tournament here and down in the future. I know, it's okay, we got Pioneer coming up. You'll be good. <laughs> okay. We've got uh, Reed Duke facing off against Riki Kamo, and as you can see, they, these are the top players left. They're both at eight and two from our second table, our second pod, if you will. You know, um, those pods are made based on the records of the players from the day before. The one we just watched, the Shota Benton match, that was our pod one finals, if you will. And that's, we're gonna bring you the final finals of this one because we're actually gonna come into this one on game number three. Both players split the first two games and that leaves us with our openers coming in. What are we looking at here? So Reed is on red white. Yeah, Reed, Reed is on kind of the red white equipment strategy, and Riki Kamo is on gruel oil. Okay. So, so the so some of the the, the, the top decks, strategies coming another in. Another best deck, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Jawbone Duelist is going to hit the battlefield here for Duke. This is a potentially explosive card. It's a 1-1 one, one double strike, but it has Toxic 1, so it effectively has Toxic 2 if it gets through. And then, as you might imagine, any type of combat tricks or anything are beautiful with the Duelist. And always scary to block. Very. When you have that Jawbone Duelist here. Is it scarier not to block or to block? <laughs> well, it's really scary either at way. least... If you're on the Gruul side, you know that your opponents are playing with mountains and plains, so you know that they're, you're less likely to at least get toxic out or die to, die to poison. But Reed here, missing land drop number three, does have a pair of toxic creatures in play. Yeah, maybe he could put together a little poison kill. But uh, 
The more pressing issue is the one you mentioned, Paul, that that third land drop not hitting for Duke, Ooh. especially while his opponent, Ricky, is turboing things out here. He's got Contagious Vorak, and you saw him on instep put that counter on Rustvine Cultivator, so he'll have access to five mana next turn. Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's the best common in the set, but it's certainly my favorite common in the set. I love the it's, art, It just too. does everything. He's a good boy. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a land off the top of the library here for Duke and or can he continue to function on two mana? I mean, right. sometimes these decks have a very low curve and, you know, he could have a one drop and another two drop and still be able to do things until he hits his mana. But, you know, you don't hit your third land drop. Sometimes you just have to say go and yeah. then all of a sudden the it, game falls it's apart. It's still rough. I mean, even if you're just playing a spell every turn, you're playing two drops. Your opponents are playing threes and fours and fives. So you're just going to fall, fall behind on board even if you're doing things mm -hmm. with a low curve deck. Is this going to be a spell bomb? A, a skull cycle, bomb, I mean? A cycled skull it bomb? It is. I just had the feeling there yeah. that with the hesitation there, is he going to hit his third land? Not sure. If he doesn't, you got to feel like he's going to fall too far behind to beat Ricky here. Right, because now we're at that point where there's several... Oh, oh okay. <laughs> you had to think about it. My, my question is, okay, okay. But not attacking with the Jawbone Duelist. And the Duelist of okay. Deep Faith got in there as well. Let's see. I suppose the Jawbone Duelist is just holding back the uh, the Stalker over there. You know Riki's just going, look, you, you played a Skull Bomb and you cycled. Did you really have to take that much time to play the land? I mean, come <laughs> on. If you drew it, you're going to play it, right? Yeah. <laughs> You've covered enough Reed Duke, though. What he yeah. does is, is he thinks through all the stuff and right. does all the stuff. Exactly. Yeah. He, he, he's just, he was just coming up with the plan. He's like, I'll play a land. I'll attack with this. I'll oh, have that. Geez. This will block this. Oh, boy. Urbask yep. Anoiner. But this was sort of the, I wouldn't call it fully face up, but, you it know. It was somewhat the, telegraphed. The likely. <laughs> yeah. Free from fl flesh. And it does work here as it was only one damage coming across from the Anointer. Also, it acts as a great blocker, right? That would that now became a three-three double strike on defense. So even the contagious Vorak couldn't come in. Right. So now the Jawbone Duelist there. Those are two oil counters. Yeah. The duelist. There are really almost zero plus one plus one counters in the format. Yep. So whenever you see these die on creatures, for the most part, they will be oil counters with very, very few exceptions. Yeah, I mean, the the format was built such that minus one, minus one counters and plus one, plus one counters just aren't a thing. Right. Some creatures sort of got around it, you know, and they said, I get plus one, plus one for each oil, oil counter. counter. Yeah, but unfortunately for Reed, Jabo and Duos is not one of them. All right, the Centurion's going to hit the battlefield Ooh, and land. critically, there's another land. I do wonder what the situation was last turn if perhaps um, that land actually was in hand for Duke. Mm -hmm. And when he cracked the Skull Bomb, it was like, well, maybe I can hit an untapped land or, you know, I'm not going to do anything else with this. At any rate, he's back up to four mana now, and uh, we got a game on our hands. We do, we it's do. It's a stalemate, though. It is a bit of a stalemate, and typically in these situations, of course, it just depends on what people have in their hand. But the, the, the red-green deck typically plays the bigger threats. Right, and the red white deck looks to kind of play it, uh, you know, slightly lower mana curve. Oh, how about Miglos, aka the best rare in the set, Paul? Yeah. That one is the king, and uh, Reed Duke is going to need to find an answer for that absolutely immediately, or it will 100% take over this game. That thing is incredible. I mean, just the three mana four four is obviously strong, but then how do you block it? And then also, if you just play an artifact, which there are plenty of in this set, it also just kills those things for free. It's incredible. Almost impossible to, to get into combat with. A cackler? Yeah. That ain't it. That, that's not going to get it done, and we're probably going to see Riki just start getting in here. It's really tough because every time somebody... What is that? That's the Pandrel? <laughs> what? Wow, how about just back to back and just go rare? Well, you know what? I could do a little better rare than that. Rare into Mythic. mythic. Rare. Double the wow. power and toughness of each creature you control in, in every combat. By the way, every combat. So you can use this on <laughs> offense and defense. How about right now? Oh, you know. Oh, just my a six, goodness. Six. 
So let's see, what do we have here? A 6-2, a 6-6, six, six, an 8-4, and an 8-8. Eight, eight. Okay. Um, I wonder... <laughs> <laughs> okay. You may block read. Yeah. You now have the option. Yeah, here's my attack. <laughs> oh, my. I wish you Godspeed. Um... This one is over, Paul. There is, there is no just nothing. I way. Mean, if Reed was on five lands, and then we knew that he had the Eternal Wanderer in his in his deck, we could be talking we, about something. There could be a shot. <laughs> but right now, I mean, how do you come back from this? Reed is just going to die in two turns here. I've done a lot of drafts in this format, Marshall. I think this is the first time I've actually seen a Zopandril in play. I've seen it in play. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. W were you the one casting it? Nope. Yep. Yep. And so I, I, I was can in imagine the Reduke seat. And you were in the Reduke seat. <laughs> and the predictable happened. You had a nice curve of twos and threes and fours, and then <laughs> I instantly did. lost. I was playing white black. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my opponent had 2020s, and they were killing me with it. And mm. Reed, you know, ooh, ooh, is, is this is professional. This, uh, will this be able to trade for a creature here? 14 damage on its six. He just took 14. Oh, my goodness. He went from 20 to 6, and he lost three of his creatures. And he's got a 3-2 in play. And the best he could do was take out what was originally a 4-2. Right. And he's dealing with an 8-12 reach creature in combat. He can, of course, make it not block. But I don't think Reed is in a position to attack here. I just... Oh, I would attack here. Uh, attack and then scoop it up? Yeah, go down right. swinging, man. Sure, sure. I got the last damage in. Get you down to 15. You remember that next time you try to cast Miglos into <laughs> Zapandril on me. <laughs> Reed has to show that he's unintimidated. Looking at his hand. Yeah, I don't like the numbers. <laughs> you, you saw him doing a little bit of quick math. Okay. So. Oh, that's Okay, this is the good. best possible answer for that Miglos. Is, that is awesome. But the problem is Zapandril. I mean, Zapandril is much more powerful than Miglos, you know. Right. Pound for pound, right? It's a seven drop versus a three. And red white just doesn't have a whole lot to deal with this sizing. No, right? E even even if you make it so that it can't attack, that trigger still happens every turn. So we got in a six six, yeah, an six, eight twelve, 16, and a two four. Yeah, not bad. Okay, and whatever else is, I mean, Riku Riku is probably going to play another mythic rare here. We'll see. Okay, so that's a safe block. Reed can actually keep the sentry alive. And then has to chump everything else. But he has to chump both of the other two, and he is in red alert. Oh, no, there's mana being tapped, too? Oh. Wow, okay. Titanic growth just Get to wipe the Get the Migos back. Oh. Yeah. The... Sure. Riki, no chill. <laughs> like, this is rough. Get those five oil on there, too, by the way. And that's yeah. going to be it. Riki Kamo with an absolute destruction in game three sends Reed packing. Now, records wise, our players were eight and two in that pod coming in. So that's going to make eight and three for Reed. And Riki's going to improve to nine and two with a decisive victory over Duke there. That was gross. Yeah. So getting a little bit closer. Of course, if you hit match win number 12, that does guarantee you a slot in the top eight. So going nine and three with that savage, savage deck. I kind of just wanted to see that deck. I want to see him play that deck more. Seriously. That just looked like a really, really fun deck to play. Yeah, you know, the red-green deck is already kind of all about power and toughness, even down to the common level, but that was next level power and well, toughness. Yeah, that's the thing. That's why that deck is so strong, because you can build a fantastic deck just with the commons, right? That's right. But then this is what happens when you also get the rares and mythics. All right, well, we've got our third feature pod table here as well, where we have Nathan Stoyer up against Mark Marcio Carvalho, and uh, we're going to join this one in game number two, as uh, apparently Nathan took care of business in game number one, and it took him a whole one minute and 41 seconds to win that game, I assume, mana or mulligan issues uh, over on Marcio's side. But we're going to join it here, where it looks like Marcio's on a mulligan to six this time, but he is at least on the play. Nathan, not slowing down here. He's got Malco so winning the World Championship. Blue green. Blue green. You don't see that very often. Yeah. So blue green was the archetype of all the decks that had only one trophy, one 3-0 from all of day one. As it is, I believe, just 
consensus the worst color combination. But given that Nathan is still eight and two and blue green, you have to imagine he it was open and yep. that he probably has some very powerful rares in his deck. Really nice start for the blue white artifacts deck here from Marcio. He's got Malkator's Watcher into Eye of Malkator. Yep. Now every time he plays an artifact, that Ibe is going to become a four four until end of turn, and he can start smashing even through this board. Yeah. Now, Nathan could line up a double block here, and Marcio would just get the Vorak off the battlefield, most likely. Let's see what he's got for turn four. Cephalopod Sentry is, of course, the card that comes to mind. It's the signpost uncommon for this archetype, and it would be kind of the... Oh, there it is! Cephalopod Sentry, it. baby, baby! You called it, Marshall. So that's going to trigger the eye, and Marcio will have to decide if he'd like to make that trade, and he would. Right. And so the quick okay. double block there, and just as you predicted, Paul, it's going to be the Contagious Vorak that dies. Now, that is going to shrink down the sentry by one. It does count how many artifacts you have under your control, and he just lost one, but fine trade. Yeah, but no shortage of artifacts if you're going to be drafting this this blue-white deck. And frankly, not a lot of people want those artifacts. So right. you often table them. They're free, right? These watchers, people don't take very highly the eyes. So whenever you see kind of somebody playing a blue-white deck, you have to think, uh-oh. They're probably running something like 18 to 20 artifacts in their deck. Yeah, that is what this deck is all about. You know, the other decks in the format don't really care about artifacts particularly. You know, it's about blood counters or toxic and stuff like that. But it is really about having artifacts on the battlefield and having them enter the battlefield that, that matters here. This is a big turn here for Stoyer. He is down to just the Icar Synthesizer and has to kind of rebuild his board. Yeah, I'm wondering, if does he have something like a Mesmerizing Dose? That would be great. Whoa, he's just, just going to pass. pass. A long tank, and then huh. he just ships it back. He's got six cards in hand. So he's got something. Marcio has to think about the different counter spells potentially, that Nathan could be playing here. Yeah, and I think we're going to see one right now. Something on the stack here, maybe? Yeah, Reject Imperfection. I don't know what got, what got countered there, though. Unctus. Unctus is... Uh... Wait, no. Three, 14? 14. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> but he actually had a follow-up um, Malkator's Watcher there, and it's the Retrofitter, I think, that got countered? Yeah, it's countered. the Retrofitter. Yeah, so that would have actually made one of those Watchers a 4-4? Four -four? Yes, it would have. Yeah. That is a nice little so, combination. Good thing to counter. So now the Fisher getting in the way of the Watchers, but the Sentry can still comfortably attack through it here. Ooh, and it looks like it's going to get skull bombed away. Oof. And this is a big hit. He's down to nine as Nathan Stoyer. And given that that was Nathan's big play last turn, you might see him just run it back here, unless he was able to find a removal spell or some kind of answer to this Sentry. I like how we're in the finals of this pod, and both players are playing blue. Hmm. We'll note, though, going in, the color combination that people favored with blue was white, right? Because they're just, it's a very highly synergistic deck. And if you are the only blue-white drafter at the table, you can still have a nice, solid 3-0 deck. I really wonder if, if Nathan wants to run back out the Quicksilver Fisher. He's going to be aware of not only a card in the format, but in the deck uh, is bring the ending, huh. but instead he's going to go with Meldweb Strider. So that means he's going to take a lot of damage this turn. How many artifacts can Marcio play this turn? Yeah. Right, that Cephalopod Sentry is going to be able to crash pretty hard, depending. Yeah. So, did he sack a land? Yeah. Okay. So this is minimum five damage coming in. Okay, no artifacts. Okay, well, that works. Though it is over half of the remaining life total of one Nathan Stoyer, so he can't be happy about it. Does it have reach or something? No. I think it has vigilance. Oh, is he going to give it flying? That's what it is. Okay, oh, yes, that's what it is. Yeah. Oh, but Chrome oh, Prowler is oh, going to come down in response and tap the Meldweb Strider. It's like, let me read this spell. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm just going to I'm just gonna get it out of the yeah, way Yeah, that ain't happening. Yeah. And by the way, That's that is point an of damage. artifact as well, right? Yeah. So now it's six damage coming across. Down to three goes Stoyer. But remember, he's up a game. 
Yeah. But I think he's uh, going like, to tie it again <laughs> here pretty quickly. Likely seeing a third game here. Let's see if Stoyer can come. Even the watchers are problematic at this point. Yeah. And killing those is painful because you get the card back. Well, there's a Quicksilver Fisher once again. Yeah, and that's, that's going to just be chump blocking the sentry at this point. Yep. And well, it matches up so poorly with that sentry. Right, and then the synthesizer will probably have to, ch will, will be chumping the prowler. And then go down to one. Two cards left here for Nathan Stoyer as Marcio checks. And he's going to come in the air. Oh. There is two mana being bounce, tapped. Bounce. There. Well, we couldn't see what he actually cast. Ruthless Predation? Okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a, it. it's a Serum Snare. Serum Snare? Okay. Okay, Serum Snare. Bounce, bounce your, your Cephalopod. Eat the Watcher. Replay the Sentry. Okay, so he's still alive. Still hanging in All right, there. He gets to untap. You have it was an unblockable He, he needs feature. an answer for the Sentry. Oh, Kanker ooh. Bloom is an answer for the Sentry. Crew and then sacrifice to kill the sentry. Oh, oh is he coming Nathan back? Nathan Stoyer showing us a little something, something. Keep maybe still want to keep the Fisher back. You can still get in with the synthesizer if you have another play, because you still want to be able to block the Chrome Prowler. The Strider does have vigilance. You can crew it and block. If you keep the synthesizer back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is getting the benefit now having four oil counters on it. So it's just going to be the Strider. And Carvalho looks like he's going to just take it. And now we're going to see right. Anchor Bloom wow. get sacrificed. Okay. Marcio has no, no good attacks now. <laughs> oh, man. A removal spell for the Quicksilver Fisher would be real interesting here. Stoyer down to, to one. one. Oh, <laughs> sort of Forge and Frontier. Where He's did like, that come from? I'm going to block that so fast. Now, it is still a trade. And, and in this matchup, it's, it's mo oh no, excuse me. It does have protection from green. Yep. But all, everything Nathan has in play is blue. So it's mostly plus two, plus two. Still, 5-4 is pretty nice yeah, here. Yeah, forces the trade with the Strider. Uh oh, this is a quick mana tapping, though. Maybe... Oh, okay. He's just not putting his cards. Where, Where are the spells? See them. Oh, there okay. it is. He's putting them down in front of him. I see. Yeah, th th a lot of people do that. Oh, it was, it was um, is... Vivisurgeon's insight. That's draw three. Oh, what is this? He must have another play here. And look at this. Marcio's going to sniff it out and actually make the trade. That, yeah, and you normally wouldn't see that, right, no. from, from most players. But no. Mar Marcio saw that, and he's going, okay. And that was smart, because that Raptor could actually crew up the Strider, so that was the right play. Now, can Marcio just continue to play creatures? That's all yep. he really needs, and he does have one here. But now Nathan can continue attacking with the Synthesizer and just keep the Raptor back, right? Yeah. One four flyer is the perfect sizing it's perfect. against the 3-3 Watcher. And he just drew three cards. Down to 12 goes Marcio, and, and yeah, it, with those three cards and all that mana oh. available. Ooh, this is going to be really good. Tamio's Immobilizer will work against whatever the sword is on. And, and he can really turn the tables yeah. on this quickly. And, and I didn't he was supposed to do it right away. Didn't attack with the Raptor? No, I'm surprised. Just choosing to, to perhaps maybe play around a, a Chrome Prowler or something? No, that wouldn't have done it because Marcio would have cast Chrome Prowler on the Immobilizer end of turn. Okay, Watcher gets tapped. Okay. Does Marcio have another creature? What is that land? It's Mirix. It's Mirix, okay. I mean, Nathan is at two, right? Absolutely, those every cre It just makes a creature every single turn. Can Nathan kill Marcio before he can just go wide? He's going to have to put the pedal to the metal with Nathan at only two life. Oh, he's oh, got his own beat problem? down. So that's three, six, ten damage. He's close. Ten damage. Can he put a couple of oil counters on this raptor? I think that's a surgical bay. It's been sacrificed. 
All right, it looks like he's going to line okay. up a two-turn clock here, Paul. Two-turn clock. This is very, very close. Incredible comeback here from Stoyer. Maybe. That canker bloom. <laughs> it never has been that the same That was a same. big canker bloom. That card's been performing if, very well. If Nathan... I mean, I don't know what Marcio has here. He drew the land for turn, so probably doesn't have a whole lot of other options here, right? He would have played the Prowler on the previous turn had he drawn it. Mm -hmm. So there's a Phyrexian Might off of Mirix. Looks like he's, he, he is does thinking. have something to do here. This is end step, right? Nothing. Okay, nothing. What is he this doing? is the turn, or else Nathan's going to attack for lethal next turn with the Immobilizer, right? You have two activations. You can tap the Watcher and whatever else Marcio decides to play. You can do the old tap on your turn, tap on my turn. Icy Manipulator trick. Two mana. That's Ossification, though, for Carvalho. Ossification, is that enough? Marcio is one short? Yes. Marcio is one short. Is there a way he can make this might bigger? Because that would be enough, right? If he can make one or the other bigger with the sword, but... Because, because Stoyer can just tap down the might, take one, and then tap down the flyer and attack for lethal. Yeah, yeah Marcio's going to need something else. Remember the might Anything else? Block. One more thing? Does he, have a, does he have cards? It's land go. Oh, oh but there's something to interact with ossification, and that's going to give him redundancy. He now has I think that's three, a snare. three powered creatures. What a comeback here for Nathan. Incredible job by Nathan Back Stoyer. Back against the wall for four or five turns. Really felt like he was dead. Uh, I'm just asking him. Judge. If you get scored for the runout. If I cast Serum Snare, targeting a two CMC, or just show the ossification. Okay. I targeted this. I'm just wondering if the creature that returned to the battlefield can get proliferated on or not. Good question. I believe the answer is no. But that's why we ask judges and not me. Just ask, just in case, of course. Yep. Yes. Because yes. okay. Serum Snare would have had to already resolve for the <coughs> ossification to be gone. Right. And you don't get to, like, kind of float a proliferate out there for a while. So. Yeah. And he likely knows that that's the most likely case. Yeah, but it's just always ask, worth just asking. in case. Just it, because I can't tell you how many times something was explained to me that made perfect sense and was also wrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is a little bit of, I mean, I don't know what Marcio has. Like, does he have any cards left? But Yeah, how is he going to fight through this? This is torturous. Like, right. hey, let me just ask this minor rules question that doesn't actually change the board as it sits. But, I mean, who knows? I'm, Marcio could have a card in hand. Wow. That canker is... The canker bloom? Canker bloom. Just the perfect card. Because play a blue-green deck, not a whole lot of removal, right? Yeah. I think I already put the counter on this. I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure whatever, whatever it doesn't matter. <laughs> Marcio's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you look at Canker Bloom, it's a Phyrexian fungus. Like, it was already kind of a putrid fungal mass, and then it but it's got... But Yeah, it's like, jeez. <laughs> Poor Mushroom. What did it, I mean, look at it. Yeah. Not looking great. All right, here we go. Untap now for Nathan Stoyer. He's got more? He's got a Quicksilver. Does, sure. does in fact, get the oil counter. And there's the tap, and he's going to go for the win here. Get in there. And Marcio only has lands in hand, and that is going to do it. Nathan Stoyer completes an improbable comeback to pick up the win there and continue his winning ways. Of course, we've gotten used to seeing Nathan Stoyer can't win stop losing. recently. Can't. Yeah, and he's got a uh, 9-2 record now as well. So he just keeps running up the score at any tournament that will put him in. What a comeback for him that game. I know. I mean, it just felt like every single turn, Marcio 
was just one one trick, one spell away from getting there. Even that one turn where Nathan went, you know what, I'm going to make this 5-5, five, five, I'm going to let it fly. And when Marcio cast the Chrome Prowler, you were thinking, okay, Marcio definitely He has all the bases Because that was just a total blowout. But every single turn, Nathan just had exactly enough to survive, and then turned it around. That's right. Incredible stuff for our limited rounds. That is going to do it for limited here from Philadelphia. When we come back, though, we're going to be with Maria at the news desk, gearing up for Pioneer. Don't go anywhere.